when you're up there, it's the best thing I can say is it's a, a chance to look at the earth that you've never seen before. So when you're up there and you start looking around, you're just saying, gee, this is beautiful. You know, you're the only one up there that's going to get you down uh, in the event of a problem. So um, you always feel a sense of isolation, but, but you know, I, it never fails to impress me that I look down and you can't see details, but you can see, um, you know, two thirds of California sitting up there uh, at the perch. So, uh, does that make you feel small? Does it make you feel bigger as a person? It's small. The U-2 was originally built to get up high over enemy air defenses and overfly hostile territory and take imagery. Now that's evolved quite a bit over the years. 55, almost 60 years later now, we're still flying this aircraft. However, now we're also using it for its standoff capabilities to stand away from hostile terrain and look far into hostile territory, not just to overfly. It started out as a platform to get a camera at a high altitude. and. The aircraft still excels at taking a large payload, 4,000 pounds of payload, to a high altitude. However, the payloads that we have have changed over the course of the 50 plus years we've had the aircraft. It used to be a simple camera, wet film camera, and now we're hauling all kind of new stuff up there. And we can take that data, digitize it, and then pump it through a data link. And, and the U-2 has transformed from being a single aircraft with a single camera with a single pilot on board to a, a truck that carries all kind of equipment, and we literally carry 40, 50, 60 people, whatever it is, in the back of our aircraft via data link. Because when I'm on a mission over Afghanistan in the U-2, I've got this whole entire DGS, the, uh, the ground station back here at Beale that we're talking to. They're looking at the feed, they're looking at the SIGINT, the imagery we're taking off the aircraft, and we're able to talk and work a, a real-time plan with what's going on over there. So the aircraft uh, being able to haul high, uh, payload to high altitude hasn't changed, but the, the way we do it and how we do it is completely different. I first saw the U-2 when I was about seven years old at an air show at Patrick Air Force Base in Florida where I grew up. That started to spur my inspiration. My father also worked for NASA and I had a uh, late retired uh, former test pilot that used to fly the SR-71 that moved in right next door to me. So I was kind of like Dennis the Menace and always hang around the guy and his stories of flying up high at altitude by himself. That just got me thinking one day in my career I want to fly the U-2. I wanted to fly something up there really high, just be by myself, see the curvature of the earth, the dark of the sky. I said, I said to him the same thing I still hear from people today, and this is, 19, this is 1988. They still fly those? Like everybody, you studied it a little bit in school with the Gary Power shoot down, and I was always an aviation buff. Didn't, I didn't, again, didn't have the internet back then, so everything you had to dig out of the library. I didn't know a whole lot about the YouTube program, but uh, I knew it was, uh, it was some sort of reconnaissance aircraft and uh, you know, flown the Cuban Missile Crisis and that sort of thing. My dad was an engineer in the, uh, at NASA for the Apollo program. So a lot of pilots in our neighborhood, a lot of, a lot of astronauts, that, uh, uh, the kids I went to school with. So I was, I was surrounded by aviation, but as far as the U-2 goes, I really didn't know very much about it. I told people that flying the U-2 is the easiest thing in the world between six inches and 60,000 feet above that, well, ball game's over. <clears throat> it's one of the hardest things to control. Well, basically it comes down to safely landing the aircraft, both for the pilot, for the jet, and for the sensors on board. The U-2 is such an efficient aircraft, it's almost like a big old glider with a big engine on there. Even with the engine back in idle, it's still producing enough thrust and the wings are so efficient in the ground effect that in order to get it to land, you've got to completely stall the aircraft. If you don't, It'll skip, then go up a little bit higher, come down hard and stall from too high. You can damage the aircraft or the sensors. So ideally, we want to get that thing to one or two feet above the ground and stall it right there and force it to land. And it's really hard for a pilot wearing a full pressure suit and a helmet to determine when he's a foot or two above the ground. He's got tunnel vision with the helmet and he can't see the ground coming up from his peripheral vision. So we need another pilot in the car behind him to talk him down on a radio and tell him how high he is above the ground. It's an extremely difficult aircraft to fly, and uh, the nature of our mission being single pilot, single ship uh, employment uh, makes you know qualities of officership and uh, and ability that much more important. 
Everybody that flies the U-2 has to have flown something else before they came to this aircraft. It's the hardest plane in the world to land and one of the toughest to fly in general. So we need guys that already have experience as pilots to come in this program and then we evaluate them when they get here. We actually give them a flying interview as well and see if they have the potential to meet the learning curve to be a U-2 pilot. Well, I'm sure it was developed strictly for spying, if you want to put it bluntly. Most people didn't realize about what the U-2 was, was around until powers got shot down in, in 1960. At, prior to that time, half of the UFO sightings were U-2 flights. Well, you know, there could be things that we don't know about, and uh, no one ever, gri ever griped about our take. And, uh, and I think that uh, that in itself kept us at, or better, and mostly better, I think, ahead of our possible enemy. The, the aircraft really evolved from the very earliest days with Francis Gary Powers, with overflying the target with the camera. That was the single mission of the airplane uh, to becoming, you know, a workhorse you know, a, a truck to cart the sensors to the high altitude regime. First of all, it's a completely different airframe. It's about 33% larger than the original airframe that was built back in 1955. On top of that, uh, not only is the airframe new, most of the, what we're flying now was built back in the 80s. It's been completely stripped out, new fiber optic cabling throughout the U-2, all glass cockpit in the U-2, and the sensors we're flying are state of the art. Now, humanitarian aid, uh, like we saw with uh, uh, the earthquakes in Haiti. We flew over there, took imagery to help out the re rebuilding efforts down there. <laughs> kind of gets to me <laughs> when I think about it, but uh, extremely fortunate. Uh, just loved it. <laughs> 